model agnostic. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, model agnostic um, discriminants in search for new physics using anomaly detection and, and other techniques. Also doing collider physics uh, uh, event level uh, um, clustering, which is uh, an interesting concept, but also exploring avenues in quantum computing and using machine learning in quantum computing in something which is called quantum machine learning in HEP. What I'm going to talk to you about today is these two topics, and we're going to start with the first one, which is jet quenching uh, in order to probe the quark one plasma. So there is a disclaimer here, which is I'm not a QCD expert, okay? I am a BSM by training and also by vocation, but I do uh, work with people from many different areas of HEP, and one of them, one of those, those areas that I've, I found myself collaborating with is with QCD phenomenologists and theorists and also experimentalists in trying to learn about the quark one plasma. So I'm going to introduce to you quark moon plasma, a jet quenching at the level that even I understand. So hopefully you will also understand a little bit. So the, the quark moon plasma is a state of matter that can form in heavy ion collisions. So this has been observed already in the relativistic heavy ion collider, but now so now at the LHC. You have, contrary to protons, which are very small, heavy ions actually are quite big, comparatively speaking, obviously. And when you uh, collide them at relativistic speeds, they will look like pancakes because of Lorentz contraction, uh, but they will have an overlap the, when, once they cross, the, the beans cross. Once this happens, you're going to be able to produce something which is called a quark one plasma, which is a hot, dense colored nuclear matter where the quarks and gluons are um, the degrees of freedom. So this is what we want to study, right? That's why I put the box around this. So this is the, op the physical objects of study. However, things are always more complicated and you can actually not um, uh, probe this directly. What happens is that afterwards it starts to cool down and it will hadronize. And eventually you're going to have a lot of hadrons that are going to be uh, spread out in your collider in, in, in what we call jets. So the idea here is since we can only see the hadrons at collisions of so what comes from the, from the experiments, how can we use the jets as a probe to the QGP? Or putting in other words, how can we use the LHC as a microscope to the quark one plasma? Now, you might have some intuition about uh, what is going to happen. So in part and part and collisions, like proton part and collisions, you're going to have jets, which are collimated um, uh, sprays of particles that come from hard scattering. However, when you have the medium, so when a quark one plasma uh, is generated, the jets will, if uh, very early in their lifetime, will live inside the quark one plasma. And so they will exchange for momentum and color with the medium that they are traversing, and this will modify them. And this means that isolating, isolating these jets is a very important task if you want to learn about the properties of the quark one plasma, because different properties of quark one plasma will, in principle, modify the jets differently. So the shower char, char will be modified because, for example, here you have this example of the of the of Alice, the difference between part and part on and heavy ion collisions, right? So here you have uh, a jet which is being uh, interacting with the medium. So we have to go a little bit beyond our in, a simple proton-proton intuition because it is actually a multi-scale problem. What does it mean? Because the way uh, as the quark plasma plasma is cooling down, it means that the jet will be interacting at different histories of the quark one plasma. Uh, thermal history. So this is actually a very complicated problem, and it also means that not all jet quenching is born equally. So for example, in this example that we have here, we have a back-to-back -back jet um, hard scattering, and one of the jets is born very in the vicinity in the rim of the quark one plasma, and it will leave the quark one plasma very quickly. So this jet will not be highly uh, modified by the quark one plasma medium. However, this one is going to traverse the quark one plasma for a really long time. And you can see here that it will lose uh, it will lose energy and will lose constituents to the plasma. But both of these jets were somehow modified, but we can see that identifying this quenching is not just a binary uh, uh, question, yes or not. It's more how much it was quenched, how much it was modified, which makes this a very difficult problem. And at the end, as I was saying, the only thing that we really have is jets. 
and we have seen jets all over the place. So here are two jet uh, jet jet events, one from L uh, CMS, other from Atlas, and how they are captured at experiments. Uh, well, nowadays it's actually a little bit more complicated because they, they they put the tracker and the calorimeter information together. But the best way of understanding jets is by depositing the calorimeter cells. So the, both of these detectors are cylinders, and the cylinder will have a layer which is a hadronic calorimeter, where hadrons leave their energy deposits. You can unfold the cylinder, and you're going to have like this rectangle of the grid, and the jets will be deposits along this calorimeter cell, which are then reconstructed using all reconstruction algorithms like NTKT. So our task now is trying to understand if the, um, the, the jet branching pattern, so you can see like a jet is going to be a collection of four momenta. You can say that each one of these cells is a, uh, somehow is a four momenta. If you had like an infinite resolution, you would be able to see each individual uh, constituents of the jet, but life is more complicated than that. So these, these, these cells are finite. And uh, we want to see if there's something in the branching pattern, something that is inside the jet that will tell us that the jet has traversed and interacted with a quark and plasma or not. So this is what we are trying to understand. People have been looking at jets with great interest lately, using namely jet substructure, which is basically what we're talking about, looking inside the jet to try to understand if there were interactions with quark and plasma, and also looking at global observables, which are usually more manageable to work with at an experimental setting. So this has led us to our first uh, publication. So here, Liliana and Guilherme are our QCD theorists. So if you want to shout at me for my QCD, uh, do not, uh, uh, I'll have to say that everything that I know, it was explained from them. So you can always email them and they will answer the questions about QCD better than I do. Then we have Nuno and Hoot, which are two Atlas experimentalists and Felipe was doing her masters with, uh, with Guilherme at the time. So we use deep learning. What is deep learning? So deep learning is just a subclass of machine learning algorithms that train the so-called neural network. So I'm not going to present to you what neural networks are or deep learning is. What you have to keep in mind is that neural networks are very powerful machine learning algorithms that are highly versatile. They can intake data in many different formats, namely can take data for like, for example, text, audio, images, video, you name it. Okay, so they're incredibly versatile and they are the backbone of all the modern machine learning and AI uh, applications that you see uh, on the internet, even every time that you interact with your phone or Netflix and et cetera. And we followed a paper by uh, Kaminsky, Metadiev and Schwartz where they use this idea that the kilometer cell can be turned into an image. Remember that the kilometer can then be unfolded into a rectangle with a grid. And so you can take the grid as being pixels where the intensity of the pixel would be, for example, the energy deposit. In their case, they actually used three channels, red, green, and blue, right? And they, uh, for each one of them, for example, the red, they put a traverse moment on the charged particles, for the green, a traverse moment on the new particles, and for the blue, the charge particle multiplicity. Obviously, these are phenological quantities because you do not have like uh, this level of, of discrimination at the, at the experiment. But still, using this proof of concept at the phenological level, they prove that uh, without using any other information besides the images that you get and using something called a convolutional neural network, which is a neural network um, uh, dedicated for image processing for computer vision, that you get state of the art discrimination of quark induced versus blue and induced jets. Okay, so from this, we then move onwards to our case. In our case, we don't have quark versus blue, and we have uh, vacuum versus uh, medium, or if you want to rephrase it, proton proton versus. Lead lab, or even quench versus unquench, all of these are going to be synonym. And you're going to see that the labels of the plots will change, but they all mean the same thing. And this is what we set out to do with our own physics case. So our physics case was then to generate uh, two different samples. One of them, which would be Z plus jet uh, created in what you would call the vacuum. So proton-proton collisions where there is no medium. Uh, being produced, so there are there is no uh, history of the jet inside the medium. So those we can call vacuum because they will never experience the medium. And then the other sample we generated 
with uh, a simulation of the quark point plasma by Joule. And in that sample, medium can be produced because we have heavy ion collisions. And so there will be medium presence and the jets may or may not interact with it depending on how long it traverses. The reason why I did Z plus jets is that ZZ is uh, colorless and will give us a very nice um, discriminant to evaluate our methodology, which is this quantity called X of jet Z which is basically the ratio of the jet energy over the uh, Z resource momentum. So the jets are reconstructed back to back with the Z. And so because the Z does not interact with the medium, we then have a measurement of how much energy uh, a jet can lose to the medium. Notice here that the medium sample will have jets which will be vacuum-like, right? Because not all quenching is made equal. So some of the jets might not interact a lot with the medium. This is a very important uh, concept to have. The only standard candle that we have is the vacuum sample, because in that one, we do know that there was no medium, okay? So, but nonetheless, we already see what we expect, which is jets lose energy. Uh, PT, uh, here you can see that the PT is shifted to the left. They also lose constituents um, in comparison to the vacuum type jets. So our pipeline was all, uh, was the same pipeline for both samples, but one had the simulation of the medium and the other one was just vacuum, but we did everything the same. So the same initial processes that would give you Zeppelin's jets. We then use the same hydronizer, the Pythia, and then everything else was the same. So the jets were uh, identified and reconstructed using a TKT, fast jets, so exactly the same uh, for both cases. The only difference is the presence or the absence of the medium. And we went a little bit beyond of what the other paper did. You can, represent the jets as images, and this is actually what we did. So you have here the, the um, uh, an example of this. So you have here uh, what would be the average image, for example, for the PT distribution. And you can see that there is a difference between the, the PT distribution of vacuum versus a medium, but also used a number of constituents. However, these have the absolute value of the PT and the number of constituents. And we also wanted to address what would be a uh, discriminating power of using images that have been normalized by the number of PT in this channel and the number of constituents. So we have what we call the normalized images that have the absolute value of the PT and the multiplicity, but also normalized images that have uh, where both channels are normalized to, to someone. Then we also represented the jet in, the, in what's called a lunge plane coordinates. So once you have a jet, and jet was reconstructed by the NTKT algorithm, you can then recluster it using the cambridge hachem reclustering uh, sequence. So the cambridge hachem is one of the good clustering algorithms. It's from the same family as the NTKT, but it, um, it clusters the constituents, or it does performs the clustering of the jet by angular ordering. And that is important because it is known that, at least in vacuum, that the history of the jets follows an angular order, which is the same as the, so the QCD ordering, or the, the, the ordering of the QCD phenomena is angular order in the jet. And so this Cambridge Aachen uh, reclustering sequence will uh, have some history or some notion of history of the jet. And we then use what's called the principal branch of the loom coordinates. So the loom coordinates are just, uh, so you have a jet that has going to have splits. And so the loom coordinates are just the KT of the mother, which would be, for example, here. And then this is basically the angular aperture uh, to the to both daughters. And there are many ways, depending on the, um, on the jet, uh, you can plot different paths in the loom plane. But for example, here, you can see that branch out to the, to the red one. And so we kept the, only the, the principal branch. We collected all these tuples of coordinates. And so that will be our sequence. Finally, we performed a, 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 also a classification just using the information of the PT of the jet and the normal constituents just to assess how much discrimination are in, is in these two variables uh, together. And here's an example of the first which is actually the last, but the first uh, branching of the Cambridge-Aachen algorithm. And you can see that for the vacuum and the medium sample, they are different. So there is discrimination. So there is information in in, the, in looking at the, the, um, the, the jet this way. So this was a coordinate item motivated by our QCD experts, Lillian and Guillermo. So we have the jets uh, represented in different 
in, in different uh, in different formats, so how do we actually process them? So we have images, and for the images, we're going to use a convolutional network, just like in the other paper, what people did. For the loomed plane coordinates, uh, we're going to use a recurrent neural network. So a recurrent neural network take uh, has inputs sequence of points, right? So sequence of coordinates. And then for the tabular, which is just the PT and the number of constituents of the jet, we just use a dense neural network. So each architecture, and this is important to, to retain, uh, embodies distinct assumptions or biases regarding the data. This is called inductive bias in the machine learning algorithm. So for the images, we're going to use a convolutional network. There is, it's assumed that the information is encoded not only as a grid, but there's a hierarchical compositional bias from local to global. So the convolutional network always looks locally first, and then as the more layers progress, you start uh, gaining a glo global understanding of the jet. And the LUNT, we're going to use a recurrent network, which assumes that there is a causal dependence between each step of the sequence, okay? So this is the assumption. And finally, the tabular just, just assumes that there is no other relevance because it takes into, uh, it inputs are just tabular uh, data points, which does not have any type of the structure. So what did you find? We find that all of these four exam cases separate the jets quite well. So this is what is called the rock curve. So the rock curve, for you are not um, acquainted with, it's a measurement of how good a classifier does. It's area, so a perfect classifier, the curve would be here, it would be like a rectangle, and the area would be one. A random classifier would be this dashed line and the area would be 0.5. So any good classifier will have to have an area in the rock between 0.5 and 1. So these numbers are not uh, um, not 1, but they're not 0.5, and that's the important part. More interestingly, we see that, for example, the, the information of the PT number of constituents is actually very important because the tabular uh, dense neural network gets a very good 73% of its area, which is can see it's a lot of the information that's being captured by the unnormalizing by the loon plane coordinates. But however, notice how the normalized images still have uh, a discrimination. So there is something inside a jet which is not only the scale of the PT of its constituents and non constituents that uh, can be used to discriminate between medium and vacuum jets. And I can ask, how do we know that we're actually discriminating between medium and vacuum? As I told you, we do not have a candle for modified jets, but we do have a candle for vacuum. And so we can use the output of the neural networks as a discriminant and perform cuts. In this case, we have for the four cases, we have four different cuts of this of the output of the neural network. What is to the right of the cut, we call it classified as medium. What is to the left of the cut, we say it is vacuum. And we can see that everything that has been to the left of the cut, which are the yellow points, namely the, the ones with the white center, follow the same distribution that we already had for the vacuum. So what is being identified as vacuum by the neural networks is vacuum-like. And what is not being identified as vacuum, so what is being identified as not being vacuum, it has a distribution which is further and further away, more and more different from what is vacuum-like. So we do know that we are removing vacuum-like jets from the medium sample, which is, Good, which means that we are able to produce uh, modified jets in rich samples that people can use to study um, the quark one plasma. Okay, just a bit of water. Okay, so you might say, well, your first paper was immediately using deep, uh, deep learning on these things, but there are a lot of jet variables, both of structure and global that experiments use. Maybe you should have started with that. It's true, and that's what we did next. So here, me, Guilherme, um, the same author, the co-author from the previous paper, joined up with Marco. Marco is the current spokesperson of Alice and a very keen QCD experimentalist. And we decided to, okay, let's look at all the jet structure observables that experiments use, and let's try to understand uh, how can we try to isolate modified jets and what uh, is happening inside a jet by looking at those. To do this, we have to look into all of the possible jets of structure variables that uh, that the literature has to offer. And these are the most commonly used by experiments to produce their results. So we do have uh, some global, what you'd call global information, which are just the uh, full moment information of the jet. But then you have angularities, which are computed by looking inside the jet and having correlations between um, the jet constituents and et cetera. 
We also have other observables which are derived from grooming uh, grooming procedures, namely soft drop has this RZ, RZ and ST, and then um, Alba uh, and collaborator has developed this dynamical grooming recently that has others, and so we, we kept these observables as well. So this, at the time of the writing, when we started working on this paper, these were the, um, the, the, the set of the art uh, general substructure observables, and many of them are understood from a theoretical point of view. Okay, so and of, and these are not just from multiple from an experimental point of view, but they are also understood from a theoretical point of view using some perturbative QCD or other modeling of the of the quark one plasma. So this is where you make a connection between theory and experiment for these studies. And so we then went on to study all of all of these uh, all of these observables in in in. A, in for analysis, which you can go and look at the paper. This paper, I'm not going to go into much detail. What is important to say is that we actually did a different, um, we did prepare a different data set, which I didn't write it here. We actually did uh, produce a digest. And the reason why we produced a digest is that we actually wanted to do something where the PT of the jet was no longer relevant information. So these digest samples were produced in such a way that after the initial cuts for the analysis, you can see that the, um, the distribution of the PT for now here and quenched means vacuum and quenched means medium. The names will change, but it's always blue for vacuum <laughs> and orange for medium. Okay, so if you are uh, concerned about that, orange is always lead, lead slash medium slash quenched. Blue is always vacuum PP and quenched. But depending on your collaborators, the names of the samples change. Anyway, so the PT is no longer discriminant, uh, a good discriminant between medium and vacuum jets. This is what we wanted. So we're trying to focus more and more and more on the substructure information and not on global information of the jets. So what did we find? First of all, we found that most of this um, uh, observables are actually highly, highly correlated. We were actually quite surprised to the level of correlation. And one of the main messages of our paper is that the, actually most of them are carrying exactly the same information about what's happening inside the jet, not inside each one of the samples, but also um, in the task of discriminating. So from all of these, uh, actually how many are there? These are around, around 20 something observables. From all of these 20 or something observables, you can actually find even single observables that have the discrimination power of the entire data set. And the best, uh, the best machine learning discriminant that was trained on the entire observables can actually be, uh, um, the performance can actually be found by, just by a set of two observables. In this case, we have present here two observables that have exactly the same discrimination power than the entire data set. What is interesting here is that we really observe something at the QCD people already knew about the phenomena of jet quenching, which is population migration. But this was understood at the univariate level that observe that uh, the, the effect of quenching moves the distributions from vacuum to another place. And here you can see that it actually follows the same line. And so that's another conclusion of our paper is that not only the things are highly correlated, the correlations with observables is highly resilient to the presence of medium. So the medium does not spoil the correlation between observables, which was something that we were not completely um, expecting. But you can see that this is actually a very difficult uh, discrimination task. It's more difficult than the previous paper with an area of the crop curve of only 70%, whereas before we were able to get like 74, 75. But then you can say, well, this is a different sample, so you cannot really compare to the previous results. So now you should do a low level deep learning a study of this sample. And this is what we're doing right now in a paper that was I was hoping that would come out in 23, but it didn't, it didn't happen. So the 24 paper, where we're moving forward to another, uh, to another architecture. So if you remember in our very previous first deep learning uh, paper for, for this task, I told you that different architectures embody different uh, biases about the data and how the information is encoded in the data, right? So then we ask the question, can we have an architecture that has minimal bias? So that actually does not assume anything. And this is the lowest you can get in our, this is what we think is the lowest you can get, which is something called a transformer network that you will know because it's the backbone of ChatGPT, which is all the rage nowadays. Large language models are based on this. 
And what it does is here you can imagine that this lattice Q jet coming in. So even though they have different letters, you can imagine this jet coming in. And what it does is it learns an agency matrix between every constituent of the jet. And what this means is that uh, in principle, we'll be able to learn any pairwise relationships between them. And very importantly, this is permutation invariant. You can do permutation of the jet constituents at the input, and it will not change the result of your classifier. So this actually is operating on a set. So we have our jet, which is a collection of form momenta, and it doesn't matter how we order them. We do not need to order them by any clustering algorithm sequence. We do not order by PT. We do not order them by anything. We just give the neural network as a set. And what can this neural network do? State-of-the-art discrimination. And in fact, we are being very careful in writing this paper because we have proven in this paper that we are proving that will come out uh, hopefully next month or in the next, uh, in the next couple of months, it is possible to have jets of pure modified jets or putting in a different uh, light. It is possible from a collection of uh, heavy ion jets, so jets that might that generated in an environment where the minimum exists, it is possible to remove every vacuum-like jet. And this is something that the QCD community on quarkum plasma didn't even know if it was possible. And we have an answer, which is very um, positive for these studies. And so the rock under the curve, you can see that is a lot, lot larger than uh, in our previous paper. Okay, for all the QCD experts in the audience, I have to do the obvious uh, caveats and disclaimers before you start shouting at me, okay? So we are very much aware that this is a single only phenomenological study, okay? There is no underlying event, there is no thermal radiation, back reaction, etc. We are also very aware that our uh, medium simulation was only from Jewel. There are other simulators in the market that we haven't considered. And there's also no guarantee that our results are infrared and collinear set. So hopefully by saying this, I will avoid some comments, <laughs> but I'm still open to questions on this. And now just a very quick pause for me to get some water. And I'm going to change completely subject. So paraphrasing virtual marks, I hope you like the topics that I'm bringing to this con to this talk. If you don't, don't worry, I have others. So if you didn't like QCD, if you don't like QCD, now I'm going to talk about PSM. If you like QCD and don't like PSM, maybe the talk is not going to be as interesting for you. But now we can talk about a bit of PSM. Now, any PSM person knows that when you create a model and then you want to find out if your model is still valid and if you're still uh, up for receiving a Nobel Prize in 50 years time, that scanning parameter spaces can be computational and time consuming. So normally what you do when you try to scan parameter spaces is this approach. So you sample a point from the parameter space, then you're going to have some computational routine, Sphino, SoftSUSI, Micromegas, CalCap, uh, MathGraph, I mean, uh, everything, Higgs bounds, Higgs tools, Nowadays, there is a plethora of, uh, of these um, tools and then from which you can compute physical quantities or observables, and then you, you want to constrain them. You, you can have theoretical constraints, but you can also have measurements from experiments, limits, upper bounds on, on masses or couplings and etc. And then you say, is this point valid or not? Yes or not? You keep the, you keep the yeses and you discard or not. Usually, this can actually be uh, uh, provide, uh, can actually have very low parameter sampling efficiency. Namely nowadays that we have so many software tools to constrain our, our BSM models, and we also have a lot of experiments from both direct and indirect measurements. Nowadays, anyone bringing a new model to the table is immediately confronted with this task of comparing the model against a myriad of uh, different constraints. And people usually, when faced with a problem of not being able to fully explore the parameter space, will then adapt uh, uh, simplifications, usually go to alignment limits or uh, go to regions of the parameter space scan that you already know that you're going to find something, you're going to reduce some constraints, and then you said that you're going to address your other constraints in the future work, and etc. And what I'm going to try to tell you today is that you do not need to do that anymore. So, we are not the first ones to try to bring in machine learning to solve this problem. So some people have brought in uh, uh, regressors, which are machine learning models that try to predict a, a value, a number, 
to try to uh, try to not have to use these computational routines, which usually are the heavy ones. Some other people try to use a classifier, which just tries to predict a class, for example, zero, one. So yes or no, valid or invalid, try to uh, go around the entire uh, pipeline. Some other people have been even suggesting something different, which is if you already have a collection of good points, you can then try in generative models to uh, learn the distribution of these points and to sample more points and um, so that you can have more points. However, I'm going to argue that all of these suffer from the same problem which is they all require large amounts of data before they're actually really useful to scan a parameter space from a new model. So we have a new model that wants to scan a parameter space. Any of those three approaches will uh, unfortunately require you to already have a lot of valid points in order for them to be valid. Why? If you don't have enough valid points to cover the entire parameter space, then your regressor will not find the correct map between the parameters and the, uh, and the correct value of the observables. The same thing, if you're not covering the whole parameter space and you don't have enough valid points, you will not be able to train a classifier to predict if a point is valid or not. And again, a resampling algorithms will only resample on the points that you already have. Remember what I said at the beginning, which is machine learning is still based on statistical learning theory. You learn over distributions of the data. So your generative models to resample points that you already have will only be able to resample similar points we ones you already have. It will not go elsewhere in the parameter space to uh, sample novel points that you haven't found so far. For example, in that paper of the generative model, they already started with 6 million valid points to prove that it worked. I would argue that if you start with 6 million valid points, you already solved your sampling problem. Right, so um, so these have a lot of issues if you have a highly constrained model where you are really struggling to find the valid regions of the parameter space. So it can be completely prohibitive to actually use any of these methods. And this is where we came in and we uh, presented something different. So here again, uh, so Nun is our Atlas collaborator. Fernando is my student and Maravia was working with us for a little bit, but now she elected to do a PhD in cosmology, I think in Germany. So she didn't stay with us for PhD. And uh, and Werner Porod, who is this Fino's main author. And we tried to address these questions, which is how can we actually improve parameter space sampling uh, without relying on those methodologies that need a lot of good points to start off with. So this is our paper, Exploring Parameter Space with AI, and the uh, haha moment was we need to change the sampling itself. I do not want to change this part, the computational routine. I'm OK with living with this, even if these things take around a second for a single point. And if you do, for example, consider Micromegas, a difficult dark matter model, these things can take up to a second, depending on the models that you have. But I'm OK with that. Why? Because this is an oracle of the ground truth. I always have uh, um, here the certainty that the point is valid or not if these things are well implemented. So I do not want to get rid of this. What I want is to present points to this pipeline that progressively uh, suggests points that are more likely to be valid. And how do we do this? We have to measure how good or bad a point is. And whereas in the other methodologies that you normally just discard bad points, you have to think about that those points actually have a wealth of information. Namely, they tell you on how far a point is from being valid. For example, imagine that I have a certain observable with a lower and upper bound. If I write this function, then this is what this function looks like in terms of valid observable. When it's between the both bounds, it's zero. When it's outside the bounds, it's actually giving me a quantity, a positive quantity, which is monotonic on how far you are from being valid. Right, and we will all all agree that the set of valid points for this observable with this bound will be the points at which this function is zero, which is the points that will uh, will map the observable into this area. Now you can also use your kindergarten calculus to to, con to also conclude that the minimum of this function is the same as this region. So finding valid points is now a problem of minimizing this function. Right, And if I'm here, I know that if I want to have good points, I have to go right. And if I'm here, if I want to have a good point, I have to go left. And this is what we're trying to do. OK, so we want to present 
points to my black box, which is my oracle for ground truth. And all of this comes out, right? So it will will then be compared against constraints, experimental measurements, limits, theoretical, et cetera, or beauty constraints, whatever. And it will give me that function C, which is going to be a function of the observable, which itself is a function of the parameters. So this function C is in fact a function of the parameters. This map is, can, can be highly nonlinear and convoluted, right? In, in fact, this can be a black box of a complicated computational routine that you have that might even include detective simulation if you want. So this can be a very convoluted map, but it doesn't matter because in the end, by changing theta, I will change the value of C. And so I can look for the minimum of C by changing the values of theta. So our first example was the same as the other, the, the, the people on the tall. So the, these are the ones that used um, generative models to resample. And uh, we approached the same, exactly the same physical problem, which was the C and the PMSSM for a 90 parameter, so the 90 parameter variation of the PMSSM. Our constraints were these ones. So this is actually an interesting case in the sense that for supersymmetric models, the value of the prediction of the Higgs mass and the dark matter relic density, the theoretical uncertainties are higher than experimental uncertainties. So these are actually loosen up a little bit. So it's these are not measurement, right? So this is going beyond measurements. Uh, but it's interesting because then you, you're not using a, an actual likelihood from experiment. You have to bring in some various theoretical uncertainties. And then we studied two cases. One, which is just to minimize what we call the loss of the uh, for the Higgs mass. And the other one, which would be the Higgs mass and the um, dark matter. So notice that I can sum this up right? Because the point will be valid if and only if both of them are zero. So I can sum up as many constraints as I want. It's always going to be the same approach. And how do, what did we do? We just went to the literature. And fortunately for us in artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's a wealth of uh, literature about black box optimization algorithms that search for solutions for a black box problem. And so we decided to study three different algorithms from three different classes. So a Bayesian optimization algorithm, a genetic algorithm, and an evolutionary strategy. These all have names because each one of these are going to be sub areas and sub fields of research in AI and computer science. These all have different names, which you do not really have to worry too much, uh, but they are, the three of them operate very differently between them. This is why we wanted to choose three different classes of algorithms. Very importantly, they learn sequentially. So they suggest points, and depending how good or how bad the points that they're suggesting, they will then try to suggest better points uh, in the next round. So this is a sequence. Also, very importantly, is that you do not require any data prior to run this. So you can start with zero data, OK? So methodological uh, details, we implemented this using a Python package called Optuna, which implements those three algorithms. And for each algorithm, we did 500 episodes slash scans or runs. So 500 runs is more is actually more the terminology. In each one of them, we allowed for 2,000 steps. So in total, for each uh, sampler, for each uh, physics case, we allowed a million points, so a million uh, Queries to the Oracle, if you if you wish to, to have that terminology, and then we compare them to uh, between them in terms of efficiency, so how good they were at finding new points, uh, Wachstein distance versus uniform distribution. So basically, this gives us a measurement of spread over the parameter space, and then also Euclidean distance, another measurement of spread over the parameter space, because you don't want only to converge quickly to valid points, you want to try to cover the parameter space. So these are some results. Um, so we we find that the distribution of the of the uh, um, of the observables that we were constraining is actually quite different between the different uh, algorithms. So orange is the Bayesian, this is the genetic, and this is the evolutionary strategy. And one of the first things that you have to understand is that the outcome of the samplers cannot just be interpreted like in a random sampler that you think about like easier regions, or if you use a Monte Carlo sampler, a posterior. So the output of these things are not going to be posterior. You cannot interpret like that. I wrote an entire page in a paper on trying to clarify the differences between these samplers and Monte Carlo and how to interpret the results. So I, 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 I invite you to read that. 
Uh, but the point is to try to find valid bridges of the parameter space fast and how much of the coverage we can get with these algorithms. And here you can see some of the artifacts that you get from the samplers. So the Bayesian one is the one that resembles the most the, the random sampler, right? But it does populate a lot more the regions that the random sample also populates. But these, the genetic and evolutionary strategy actually have quite obvious uh, artifacts, right? So here, the genetic one, you see like there is this vertical pattern, almost it's like a cloth, right? It appears in all of this. So this is normal. In genetic algorithms, it's called a schema. A schema is a value that uh, is good enough and there is no reason for the evolutionary pressure to try all the values of that parameter. So this is what it's called a schema. And this is very common genetic algorithms to cluster uh, along the same uh, rank, to cluster certain values of the genet uh, of, of all the parameters. The evolutionary strategy is an interesting one because the way it works is uh, like a multivariate normal running, going around the parameter space, trying to find um, the, the path of least resistance to the minimum. So it's highly local in this scan. And you can see that, which is like, these looks like paint strokes, like as if someone was coming here with different paint brushes, just uh, trying to paint, to, trying to give a painting. And so you, you get like these uh, conglomerates of, of valid points. So all of these points are valid, obviously. So with all this respect. The most important part, and this is where we actually wanted to get at, is that they are a lot more efficient than a random sampling. And this was actually not even a difficult problem. And we uh, we feel like maybe we should have started even on a more difficult problem. Because you can see that, for example, here for the random sampler, for the Higgs mass and dark matter relative density, for the CMSSM, this is actually quite a difficult problem. It is known. And we're only using these two constraints. The sampling efficiency is already 0.1%. And you can see that you can immediately boost random sampling, the, the sampling efficiency, any of them, at least one order of magnitude, but all the way to two orders of magnitude. And I cannot increase this much more because it starts to saturate closer to one, right? So sampling efficiency cannot be greater than one. And here, the same thing for the PMSSM, you start with 0.6%, and you can jump at least one order of magnitude to up to two orders of magnitude. But again, this is saturated already at one, right? So we then decided to, to, I know, okay. First this one before I go to the uh, work in progress. So this is for you to have an impression, uh, an idea of how it works. So these are for the three physical cases, CMSSM, Higgs and Higgs and dark matter, right? CMSSM, PMSSM, Higgs, Higgs and dark matter. And this is the average loss, so the average uh, value of the of the sum of the function C. And so the random sampling is always constant, right? Because the random sampling is not interacting with the black box. So it's like nothing. And the average efficiency of the sampling also for the random sampling is always constant. But the other algorithms, you can see that they start to converge. So the, the average loss is being minimized and starts being minimizing quite quickly. And the sampling efficiency rises very, very quickly. So you can see here, even here, for example, in this case, which is a CMSSM, the SMISE gets to uh, sampling of order one very quickly after just like 500 attempts. And so from this point onwards, is as a really, really high um, efficiency. Now, this was an easy problem and um, we needed to now to start developing this into more realistic problems to try to see if this algorithm survive a real test of fire, right? And now I'm working on two projects, which I'm going to just give you some preliminary results, which I hope that you will enjoy. Uh, but it's going to be a quick presentation. Both of these papers should also be coming out in the near future. So. Uh, one of them is still with Werner, and uh, Werner now got uh, a master student, Andreas. And Werner has, has done this work uh, with Avlino, which is a scatogenic explanation for the G minus two. And so this is a very interesting one because this uh, is a good example of BSM model building. So here you try to explain the G minus two, which is basically explaining uh, why these loops for the mu one are uh, big enough to explain the anomaly. However, you also want to explain Higgs mass, like metabolic density, but more importantly, neutrino data. And so 
the trino data in this model is generated radioactively, okay, through this type of um, loops. So the names are different, but these are different bases, but the neutral scalars are the same neutral scales that are running in this loop, and the neutral fermions are the same neutral fermions that are running in this loop. So you, you have two opposing forces. On the one hand, you want this loop to be big enough, right? For the to explain a G minus two, which you can say, okay, I'm going to put uh, some of these masses low, right? Some of these uh, novel BSM states and neutral ones with a low mass. However, if you put them too low, then the heat neutrino mass is going to be really high, really, really high. So the neutrino mass requires these masses to be very low. So how do you go around with this? Well, you increase the coupling, right? So if you increase the coupling here, then you can operate with lower masses. However, if you increase the coupling too high, you're going to produce flavor violation, which goes beyond the bounds. So this is a very typical case of uh, a BSM model that tries to do too many things at once, right? <laughs> Let's put it like that. And so what is, and this is actually very difficult to scan. So in their paper, they did a simplified version where they did not fit the neutrino data. They used the Casas-Ibarra parameterization Okay, where the neutrino data is an input of the parameter, and then you have to basically rotate back to the BSM uh, basis, and then you have uh, perturbative constraints and, and, and things like that. So this is a very common approach to problems. Um, and they already did, uh, they did a Monte Carlo chain, so an MCMC over a, a region of the parameter space where they already knew that points are going to be more likely to appear. In this paper, we took a different approach. We are actually fitting the, the neutrino masses and we are considering a bigger parameter space, okay? And what do we get? Uh, actually, before what we get, I have to explain what we did differently. So we not only did exactly the same algorithms, we actually brought to the table two novel ideas. So the first idea was to use this idea of multi-objective. So all these constraints, and I have how many constraints? Around 23 constraints, over 60 parameters, because we have complex numbers. So we're actually trying to fit also the neutrino phases, okay? So this is why we have complex parameters. And uh, the idea of multi-objective is that I can go into that space of the 23 constraints. And each point can be evaluated on how good it is in all the 23 at the same time without having to sum that C function. So I can just use a C function for each one of the objectives, and then I can create this thing called a Pareto front. And the Pareto front is like this. So each point is going to land somewhere in this constrained uh, space, right? And you can see that any point in the blue region cannot be what's called Pareto dominated by any other point in the blue region, but they dominate the points inside. What I mean by this? So the point C is clearly worse than both point A and B in both objectives. So point C is dominated by points A and B. Point A, however, it's not dominated by point B, but point B itself is also not dominated by point A because point A is better than point B in objective two, and point B is better than point A in objective one. And when you have all the points against all the 23 constraints, you will then find this hypersurface in this space, which is called a Pareto front. So instead of summing the, the, the values, the loss to have a single loss function, you can try to then create new population from this Pareto front and always try to get better Pareto fronts. So this is the idea behind, behind multi-object optimization. For this, we brought in a new algorithm that is made on purpose for this type of problems. We did another idea, which is we can still use a single objective like we did before, but we're going to use something called hierarchical loss function. Why are we doing this? We noticed that the reason why single objective was not converging in this case was because of G minus two. So we would very easily find reaches of the parameter space that agree with all the constraints, except for G minus two. So what we decided to do was, we approached the problem in a different way, which is we first demanded the optimizer, our evolutionary strategy to fit the G minus two, and only then, we turned on the other constraints. This is why we call the hierarchical. And by doing that, we actually were able to find points a lot more easily. And as I said before, we actually went beyond the Kasibara parameterization and we increased the size of the parameter space versus the paper by Werner and collaborators. So these are work in progress because Andreas is now writing his master thesis and we are running points. So before you tell me, 
this these plots, these scatter plots need a lot more points. It's true. So before we actually put this into publication, we are going to populate these, but we already found what we wanted to 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 find. So one thing that we found very curiously is that for for this problem at least, the genetic algorithm with high, with, with this um, methodology seems to abuse the schemas. Remember, I told you about schemas, which is when the genetic algorithms use uh, the same values. So you can. Yeah, they really abuse the schemas, and the hierarchical uh, evolutionary strategy has a better coverage. So, uh, which is interesting, and actually this converges a lot faster than in SJ3. So right now, both Fernando and Andreas uh, during the Christmas time are basically running both of these multiple times so that we can populate these scattered plots as much as we can. More interestingly is that some of these points are in, um, uh, in um, in regions that were not included in the MCMC prior. And also remember that these did not have the causes of parameterization. So we already be able to find more regions of the parameter space uh, with less simplifications, okay? Uh, in a faster time as well, okay? But we are still trying to measure, getting a good a quantifiable measurement on how fast this is over the MCMC that they use in the, their paper. Another thing that I'm working on uh, is on uh, 3HDM, namely uh, type 1, uh, 3HDM. And as you that work with uh, multiple higgs double models, you'll know that these things nowadays are highly constrained, right? Namely, the LHC has so many constraints, and you have so many other um, uh, indirect measurements like the STU, but also um, um, very important theoretical constraints like boundless from below, perturbative unitarity, and etc. So for example, here I tried to collect, we actually have 61 constraints over 16 free parameters. So these are the parameters of three HTM. So these are the mixing elements between the Higgses, the mass of the Higgses um, at inputs. So the heights of the, uh, the the mass of the Higgs are actually inputs of the of this scan. We didn't do the other way around. Um, and then you need to compare against all of these constraints. So I, I cannot show a 61 by 61 uh, metrics of how these constraints work, but I can try to collect all the bound from below constraints in one single variable, all the unitary constraints, all the STU, all the good mu. So mu are these quantities that the LHC and uh, Atlas and CMS are constraining a lot. Uh, BSG, Kappas, and the Higgs bounds. And this is a sample of uh, a million random points. And there, there are no good points in this six million, okay? And you can see that there isn't even any point which is has good unitarity. And you can see that there are a lot of zeros in the off diagonal, which means that a lot of these constraints are also quite perpendicular, right? So cost perpendicular constraints are actually effectively reducing the submanifold that is valid in the parameter space. And this is why this is so difficult. In fact, using a random search over the entire parameter space, as a as a, a something efficiency of less than one in ten billion, okay. So if we left it one week on sixteen cores and produced one point, right? So what do people do? Alignment limits. And actually, if you go to so this is a collaboration with Charger, if you go to Charger, Charger has been working a lot with Juan. Uh, also, Rafael, but Pontron, they have like a bit of an industry right now of multiple Higgs doubled models. Try to try to um, uh, try to derive all the self consistency um, constraints on the on the potential, so the bonus from below and etc. So they've been working a lot on this, and um, what they end up doing in the end of the day is they go to alignment limits because there you can find points, right? But what if I want to do something else? And now it says work in progress. I actually did these plots today, just for you. So you are the first ones to see this plot. Well, not the first ones. I actually sent George first, but <laughs> uh, uh, you are the first ones to that I'm discussing this in public and um, in a paper that hopefully will come very soon next year. So we went beyond alignment limits, and you can actually find points very quickly of order of 10 minutes on your laptop. Okay, So no need to leave it on weeks or months on a cluster. Okay. With these algorithms, you can actually find points. However, there is always this, uh, wait, sorry, not, not what I wanted to do. I don't know what I clicked on my mouse. Okay, so what did we do? So 
here's for you to have an idea. So the, here's the random sampling. Okay. We first ran this without the Higgs tools. So without the Higgs bounds. And uh, you get like 20 points. But once you put it through the Higgs bounds, you get only one point. So this was 16 cores over a week, right? You go to alignment limit, you start finding points, which is good. Then we implemented our algorithm that finds points really quickly in a matter of minutes. And uh, it finds points very quickly, but it's not the same spread as the alignment limit. And this is where the, uh, uh, the, 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 the great contribution of this paper will be, is that we developed a way to improve the algorithms to provide it with a novelty reward so that it can go and explore novel regions. It's exactly what you're seeing here. So immediately, I start having a spread of parameters, which uh, parameter points which are far greater than alignment limit, even beyond the alignment limit. So notice that the alignment limit basically cuts the points uh, uh, where the sign of this difference is greater than 0 0.5 absolute value. And I start having points over uh, beyond the alignment limit. So I already have points which are beyond the alignment limit. And now I've implemented the Higgs tools in the loop. So all of these points are green. So all of these points are, are green and uh, many of them are beyond the alignment limit. So I already found points in the parameter space that were being ignored because of the simplifications of the alignment limit. You can now say, Miguel, this is often in games, but the parameter space is not a physical uh, space. And I'll say, I'll agree with you. You can play the same game where you implement a novelty reward, not in the parameter space, but in the observable space. And this is what we've done. So again, this is the alignment limit of the two charge Higgses. Okay. So the alignment, it will give some points like this, and then you pass it through Higgs bounds and it will reduce to this blob. And here on the right hand side, I have an example of many points found by my algorithm. And these lines are the lines of the exploration. So my algorithm now has the capacity to explore. So you can, there's actually a path in the parameter space looking for points, which are valid. This is why it has this shape. And you can see that I can find values for the charge Higgs masses way beyond completely uh, not captured by alignment limit. And here, for example, for the, for the decay channels of the Higgs. So in the alignment limit here, you have the gluon gluon fusion to gamma gamma versus the gluon gluon fusion to Z gamma. So Z gamma has been recently um, observed by Atlas and CMS, and both of them point currently to a value of 2.2 at 1.9 sigma uh, um, away from the standard model. Uh, not terrible, but still. And uh, you can put the novelty rewards in this, in this space, in this subspace of observables, and you can find points which pass all constraints, including Higgs tools and et cetera, where, for example, the, the Google Fusion to Gamma Gamma has values greater than one, closer to 1.2, which completely, completely overlooked and ignored by the alignment limit scans. So this is our main message from both of these two papers, is that this, uh, these algorithms, because, because they allow so much faster parameter space scans and sampling, you can actually go where you haven't been before, and you can start learning new phenomenology from the same models that you've been working on before. So I'm going to conclude. Hopefully this was around an hour, Antonio. I'm sorry if it was not, but I'm going to very quickly say, so in, in recent years, we have witnessed a resurgence in interest in AI and machine learning in HEP. This has been driven mostly within experimental contexts and experimentalists tend to carry the flag for machine learning and AI applications in high energy physics. However, I hope that I can convince you that there is still a wealth of possibilities for applying these new technologies in phenomenology and in theory. In this talk, to promote this idea, I, I showed you how you can use uh, deep neural networks to produce state-of-the-art discriminants to isolate chat equation from the quark and plasma, answering a, a very old question in the heavy ion community, is it possible to isolate modified jets? And the answer is yes. There is something imprinted in the jet fragmentation that is unique to the interaction of the jets with the medium. This statement was not trivial until our result. And uh, secondly, for the BSM model building, I hope that I've convinced you that these algorithms can solve the random sampling efficiency problem. And because of that, you can find new regions that have, that were, have been overlooked before. But more importantly, to the science, you can find new phenomenology that was hidden away from those simplified scans. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Miguel, for the very nice and very complete tool. Question from the audience? Any questions? I was very clear. <laughs> Yes. No question from, from the audience? Uh, hello, I have a question. Hello. Yes, Paulo, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. I would like to ask you about if you have like this, like uh, you have a repository for your code in order like to use your models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually. All of these things, uh, I mean, we can look for the papers, but for example, yes, we have the code for this. And for the two papers that we are writing, we'll also have the code. We have not, so for this case in particular, for the BSM parameter space scan, we have the producing at some point. However, we are still maturing the methodology. So we do not feel like we are ready to commit to that to the community, okay? But that's the objective. And hopefully Fernando still has two years of PhD with me. Hopefully this is going to be something I'll be working on in the near future. Uh, if you're more concerned about uh, Quark 1 Plasma, et cetera, yes, we also have the code and the data online. And uh, for this case, for, for, for these results, we are also going to provide the, the train model artifacts. So that is highly reproducible. I'm a big supporter of reproducible science. Benjamin, you have a question? Uh, yes, hi. So uh, yeah. I think you maybe just uh, answer to my, que to my question, but so, uh, concerning the Corbion plasma, so did you already apply your uh, code to uh, real data? No, apparently no. No. So, so if if you if you like I did, <laughs> if you talk to an experimentalist and you say, "Look, I have this really good, uh, I have this really good ex uh, neural network that works on jet constituents, and I want to propose an analysis." They don't laugh in your face out of courtesy, but they will laugh on your back. And the reason is experimental procedure is a lot more convoluted than that in terms of um, collecting jets and their constituents. And they don't even provide this publicly. Okay, Even open data sets by Atlas and CMS are very weak in terms of statistics and in terms of what you get. You you'd never get low level information. Or it's very rare to get any low level information. You only get things which have been highly chewed by analysis. So the moving forward from this result is not as much applying to jets, but it is actually trying to understand what the neural network has found. So neural networks, unfortunately, do have the fame of being black boxes, which are very difficult to interpret. We are aware of that. We do not attempt to try, we do not try to solve that problem in this paper. We do have good evidence in this paper that the neural network is learning uh, a self-correlation polynomial of up to order 81 in the jet constituent matrix. So this is what we can tell you. Uh, this is relevant because if you study jets, you will know that there are these correlation functions, which are basically supposed to be a full set of functions operating on the jet. Um, and in, so we are pointing towards what level those functions should be if you want to make this discrimination. But the true physics would then be to find out um, what the, like a closed form solution, a closed form equation that theorists could compute uh, from first principles, or at least from perturbative KCD. To do this on an experimental level, you need to be an experimentalist, which I'm not. And there are many steps moving forward. So one of the things that I've said here in this disclaimer is that uh, this is a phenological study. So we do not include uh, underlying event or back reaction from the thermal radiation. Uh, but Guilherme's student, so this João is a PhD student of Guilherme, is actually studying embedding these samples into real-world background, 
and then produced background subtraction and then passing on to the other model. So there are many layers between what we have and what experimentalists will be able to do. We hope that after all these papers come out, we at least have something that experimentalists might feel intrigued enough to, to do. We're also hoping that our close collaboration with Marco will lead to that. And so, and so the, the idea is that uh, the idea is that you can recognize uh, uh, vacuum jets, and so by elimination you can recognize uh, in medium jets, right? Mm -hmm. And so yes. and the, the number of your uh, rock uh, plot, uh, how can it uh, be interpreted in, in terms of uh, uh, percent of uh, recognized uh, jet? So this number of 0 0.82, something, something yes. like that. So it is measurement means, uh, for 84% uh, of uh, jets are correctly recognized? Uh, no, 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 This uh, it's more difficult than that. So this area, this is the area of the rock curve. And so basically it's just giving you the area of this and this, oh. So the, the bottom, oh, the, there's a label missing here. So the bottom, the, the bottom axis is a false positive rate. So this basically gives you a measurement on for different operating points, how well your classifier is working. So, so I can do a cut at different outputs of my neural network. And for different cuts, I can compute the true positive rate and a false positive rate, right? And I can then plot this line. A perfect classifier has all vacuum just to the left and all medium just to the right. So it, uh, when you when you try to do that curve, you actually are only going to have a rectangle, so it will be a perfect classifier. So in a certain sense, the area under the curve is actually giving you an average of the performance over all possible thresholds, because all possible thresholds. But what I can tell you here and this is the important part, is that if I perform a cut on the output of around 0 0.9, I can tell you that you're getting rid of all the vacuum type jets, right? And everything that survives that will be medium type jets. So jets that were highly modified by the quarkum plasma. So in the paper, we are writing down different um, metrics for different operating points and also preparing some plots that show very similar to these plots, uh, so these plots are for operating point of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, etc. So we are producing similar plots to this, where you see that you, what you're cutting is really vacuum-like, and what you have is not. And so then you can decide on your operating point, depending on how many background jets you are willing to have or not. So this is what experimentalists do. So the, the operating point of a discriminant depends on the statistics of your sample, depends on uh, many things, more complicated than just a phenological study. And uh, if it's OK, I have a last uh, question. Yes? You continue, please. OK. And so is your algorithm also able to uh, evaluate the amount of energy loss? So what you can do now, well, that's a very good question. Uh, and the reason is we actually don't even have that information in this sample because this is an iJet sample. So we do not have that information. So this, this was highly debated between the three of us when we started this paper. Uh, why we were going to go to DiJet. So Marco wanted us to go to DiJet because he said they're a lot easier. There's a lot more statistics and experiments. So for experimental, it's more important to see an analysis in DiJet. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to reconstruct Z plus Jet. And because we don't have Z plus Jet, we don't have this uh, beautiful um, variable that gives you the information of uh, energy loss. So we are aware of that. So that would be a shortcoming uh, of, of this problem. Some other people are trying to work on that. However, Joule does not give us that information. There is another simulator of the quarkone plasma, which I don't remember the name. There are a few in the market. And there are some others that keep and physical bookkeeping variables. And you can actually access that information from the simulation, but Joule doesn't do that it's because the way that Joule simulates a quarkone plasma, uh, there is no way of keeping that type of information because it's too stochastic. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. 
Okay, thank you for the questions. More question from the audience. If there are no more questions, we send Miguel for the very nice and very complete call, and we meet at the next seminar. Thank you very thank much you for the invitation. Miguel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, so guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.